Welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle. I don't know if you heard, but USC played a football game the other day against a team from the South. It went okay. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And uh, we're smiling more than usual because this is the first time in years we've had uh, something this fun to smile about. At least, I mean, I'm not commenting on your personal lives, guys. I'm just uh, talking about football-wise. I do like it that you're uh, huddled up close together like that. It's very cute. Uh, all right, we got the usual you crew. Seat for you, Chris. Yeah, well, no thanks. We have the usual crew. Mark Culkin, Eric McKinney. I'm your guest host, Chris Arledge. Greg Katz has made uh, a couple of appearances recently. So uh, those of you who are always asking in the comments, how's Greg? He's uh, he's doing okay. He's coming back and he's enjoying this uh, the start of the season just like the rest of us. If you wonder what happened to my voice, I was screaming a lot last night uh, in a good way. This time, I mean, I've had other I've had other occasions after USC games where I couldn't talk, but uh, but uh, the screaming was not positive. Okay, guys, let's get started. Uh, let's start with this. What was the key to the win against LSU? Who wants to start us off? Your porter. Uh, the the key to the win, I think, started about eight seconds after Lincoln Riley decided on Danton Lynn as his defensive coordinator. I mean, this was this was the entire offense uh, off season was pointing to this. It wasn't just, can you make this defense better? It's, can you get this defense ready to play week one against a team? Yes, that lost three really talented skill players from that team. A quarterback and two wide receivers that were really good. LSU is just like USC when it comes to, oh my gosh, what are they going to do offensively? There's guys there. There's always guys there. There's guys that can play for LSU. USC's defense needed to be ready to go from the jump this season and they were 20 points against lsu again if you went back day one of the off season and said hey lsu is going to score 20 points are you okay with that yes yes 30 maybe you would you would have taken for how the the usc defense was so that that was the key it was everything that they they did this off season and i don't know how much everybody believed lincoln riley when he talked about defense, when he talked about we want to play great defense, we're going to do everything we can. Every, every time we're split, we're going to go defense on this. They brought in the right coaches, clearly. They made the right decisions when it came to strength and nutrition. All of that stuff that typically is maybe off-season lip service and you know everybody feels good about their team in the off-season, it all worked. It all worked. And there, there's a long season to go and you got to win a bunch more tough games. But this was one of those tough games that not a ton of people were saying, oh yeah, USC's got this. Yeah, the defensive changes, they definitely were going to work. That was the key. The, the off season and what they did on that side was the key for this game. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to focus more on the game as opposed to what happened prior to it, eight seconds after. Um, it, it, it changed at the coin flip. When Brian Kelly decided he wanted the ball first and he tested, you know, he challenged USC's defense. And LSU had a great first series, held on the ball for, what, seven and a half minutes? But what happened when they got to the red zone? USC's defense flexed. They stopped. They put up a goot. Well, LSU ended up with zero points, not a field goal, not a touchdown. But that was a key moment because that right there, at the beginning of the game, USC said, guess what? We're here. We're different. We're playing defense. We're going to be physical. We're bigger than you. That set the tone for the game. And when we got into the, well, when the teams got into the fourth quarter and USC had that chance to come from behind and win, they did it on the heels of their defense getting another stop. And then all of a sudden you got Miller Moss leading the team down in that two minute drill. You, you got to wonder if USC gives up points in that first drive, how does that change the complexion of the game? Yeah. I mean, look, Brian Kelly was right to go for it there because even if he gets stuffed, USC sure. has the ball at their own three, they have a long way to go and, 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 and they didn't end up scoring. And, and so I, I like the decision to go for it, especially because 
you're trying to drive a dagger in in the heart of USC's defense at the very outset. Clearly, making that uh, making that goal line stand uh, uh, gave a lot of confidence to a group that I think was already pretty confident. And that's sort of the interesting thing about it is it's not like the USC defenders came out and and were surprised that they could play with LSU. I think they expected to, right? I think they expected to. Um, now everybody's going to downgrade LSU, right? Now Feinbaum says, you know, these guys are these guys are barely even good enough to play in the SEC now. I mean, mm-hmm. if if you had an English Premier League situation, they probably would have been relegated long ago. And and they're saying all this about a team that was ranked 12 in one poll, 13 in another. And yes, they lost their Heisman Trophy winner. They lost some other uh, they lost some other big play guys offensively. But they return was supposed to be the best offensive line in the country, right? Two tackles who were supposed to go in the first round. Two guards who are massive and have both started 30-plus games. If you have an offensive line like that, and if you recruit the way LSU recruits, you're going to score points. That LSU team is going to score points on lots of people this year. Yeah. And, and look, everybody said before the game, I mean, despite the fact that he hadn't played a ton, he'd played you know just slightly more than Miller Moss, Miller Moss and Nussmeyer both had great bowl games, but all the talk is about Nussmeyer. Everybody says this guy can throw. And you know what? Yeah, he can. That guy's good. And LSU has a bunch of fast guys. Big surprise. LSU has had fast guys as long as I've been watching college football. If you have a dominant O-line, you're going to be good offensively. LSU has a dominant O-line. Don't try to cheapen this by saying, oh, really, they're not very good. That's not true. And and actually, they played quite well. LSU played a good football game. They played a clean football game. They turned it over once on the last play of the game, essentially, when the game was when the game was over. They played a clean football game. They played well. They had some mistakes. They had some penalties. But in that atmosphere in an opening game, um, they played a whole lot better than most of the ranked teams that we saw this past week, right? So don't cheapen this. USC completely rebuilt their defense in a single offseason. And they did it by projecting guys as players who we didn't think were going to be players. Let's be honest about this. They pick up Nate Clifton from Vanderbilt, and everybody says, eh, yeah, okay. I mean, that's fine, I guess. But he played for Vandy. He was a defensive end. Why do we need an edge guy? Well, now he's a 300-pound defensive tackle who played awfully well the other day, right? Gavin Meyer. Nobody wanted Gavin Meyer. Nobody's ever heard of Gavin Meyer. Gavin Meyer barely played at Wyoming. And then he shows up at USC, and all of a sudden we start hearing, this guy's a really good player. And you know what? It's like he is. He's a really good player. And you had all these other guys. Look, whenever, whenever you have, whenever things go wrong with the team, everybody wants to blame the coaching staff, right? Sometimes you're right to do that. And then there are always the fans who say, no, 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 the problem is these guys are all terrible. They're not fast enough. They're not good enough. They can't play, right? Mason Cobb. Mason Cobb was second team all Big 12, but he can't play. He's slow and he's small and he's not any good, right? He can't play. Actually, you know what? Mason Cobb can play. If you have a decent defensive scheme that's not atrocious, if he knows where to line up, if he understands his assignment, you let him play fast, he's actually okay. Eric Gentry, yeah, I know. He looks like a Stark. He's way too skinny. It doesn't make any sense. Alabama would never have a, a linebacker look like that. Well, nobody has a linebacker that looks like that. But you know what? Eric Gentry can play football, Right. All these guys that last year couldn't play football, they were all terrible. The talent level is awful. And we look at it and say, I mean, it's not Georgia talent. It is not Alabama talent. I conceded that all along. But I said, if they were competently coached, this could be a decent defense. That was my position. I was right. I'm not always right. I'm almost always right. I was right about that. But the thing that, the thing that I really, and, and so you have a situation where LSU badly wanted to run the football. They were very open about that, right? It's going to be a fist fight. We're going to run the football. Their first round, their future first round left tackle was talking about it, how, how you know, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to hide it. We're going to go out and run the football. They didn't run the football. I had no problem with what that kid said. He's a good player. Uh, I'm sure he'll be a fine pro. But the reality is that LSU thought they would walk out there and stomp USC's defensive front, that they would gash them for 8, 10, 12 yards of play. And I understand why they think that. 
because LSU is good, and I watched USC's run defense the last three years, and it was about the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. You can do all kinds of internet searches that take you to the darkest corners of the web, and you won't see things as ugly as USC's run defense the last three years. I understand why he thought that. But the truth is, USC's defensive line punched those guys in the face. LSU got some yards. They didn't get very many. You take away the one big run, they're at about 3.2 yards per carry, and it wasn't enough to do what they wanted to accomplish. The other thing that seems to me is um, – USC stayed composed uh, yeah. in a way that in a way that championship teams stay composed. You know, when you'd watch a Nick Saban Alabama team after they had been rolling for all those years, it always seemed like when Alabama needed to make a play, they would make a play. And when the other team needed to make a play, they would fold. Championship teams do that. USC played like a championship team. They haven't been a championship team in many years. But you need a big play downfield from a receiver? Okay, we'll make a circus catch for you. You need somebody to make a play on, on third and one because you have to stop LSU and get the ball back because you're down 17-13 and you need a chance? Okay, we'll get, we'll get a tackle for loss from Eric Gentry, a guy that couldn't play last year. I mean, this was, this was, this was a team that believed in themselves. They played like they believed in themselves. And when the pressure was on, it wasn't the big bad guys from the SEC who were making the big plays. It was USC. And that happened over and over and over again. And that's a really good sign for the future because not only did those guys believe coming into the game, they believe more now. And, yeah. and so uh, you know, when it seemed like for the last few years, any time you needed a stop from the USC defense, you'd watch the game and you'd say, okay, we're screwed. I, I know they're not going to, I know they won't get a stop. I know they won't. And it'll probably be something ridiculous. A guy, you know, uh, a, a, a big, a big running play for 50 yards where somebody. It was going to be a, a quarterback, a quarterback leaving the pocket on third and nine and going 12 yards easily without, without anybody near him yeah. every time. It was going to be, it was going to be something absurd. And you'd look back and say, this wasn't even a good effort that happened over and over and over again for the last three plus years. Right. Um, that's not what USC did last night. They stayed composed against a top offensive line in college football and consistently made plays when they had to make plays on defense. That's what they did. That's a hell of a thing, guys. And, and, and all the people are saying it's just one game. I get that. And you're never as good as you think you are when you win. You're never as bad as you think you are when you lose. Well, sometimes last year maybe we were as bad as we thought we were when we lost. But I get all that. But what I saw is a team that played physical, that played discipline, that believed in themselves and consistently, consistently made plays when they had to make it. That's those are some good ingredients for a football team, it seems to me. Agreed. Yeah, well coached. Um, okay, so that's let's. That's it. That's the game. We're done. Wrap it up. That's it. We're finished. <laughs> We're finished. The team, the team played better than, than, than we performed on this show. That's all we got. We'll see you later. All right, let's 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 move to the offense. Let's talk about the good and the bad offensively. Um, Mark, why don't you start us off? What do you think? Good and bad on the offense. So I, what was really good was Mill Moss has now started two games at quarterback. He's now thrown for over 370 yards in both games. And in this game in particular, he found the tight end. It's like, where did that guy come from? Lake McCree was, well, he he tied for the team lead with the number of receptions. Uh, he had five. Uh, that was one of the really good things. Miller Moss, you talked about the composure, willing to stand in the pocket, take a hit, but deliver a dart when he needed to, especially in, you know, high pressure, high leverage situations. Um, the dedication to staying with the run game, even though it wasn't picking up big time yards, Coach Roddy stayed with it. He kept the offense balanced. And he talked about it after the game. You know, we, we could see it, you know, what he's, he's going to crease it one time. And that game-winning touchdown, he says, I think he's going to be able to do it. And that's what they did. They stuck with the game plan. They followed through. Uh, something that Eric pointed out to me that I was, I, I thought about it, but, you know, in these two games that Miller started where he's thrown for over 370 yards per game, Guess how many receivers have had a hundred yard receiving game in both games? Uh, That's right. The number, the number is zero. There has been zero 100 yard receivings 
from the from the wide receivers. So the ball distribution, he's using the guys around him. He's not putting all the weight on his own shoulders. And you know what? When you've got that type of skill, you got the type that type of talent surrounding you, just get the ball out there. Let the other guys do the work. The bad, um, and we'll call it needs to improve, is probably on the offensive line still. They they struggled more so on the right side, I think, than on the left side. But it was a good work in progress. I liked what I saw. But I, I say if you have to pick out the bad, that would be probably on that end of the spectrum. The other thing, clock management from Lincoln Riley. That was bad, especially at the end of the first half. I tried to, I don't want to say corner him, but I asked him the question, you know, walk us through that last series because it kind of felt like he left points on the field. He would he would have been happy if he got down there for a field goal. But when you got the ball for, what, a minute 38 roughly, and you got timeouts in your back pocket, you be a little bit more aggressive. I don't think LSU was in the position because I they only had one timeout left. I'm not asking you to throw the ball when you're standing in your, your own seven-yard line or wherever they were. But once you got out there, become a little bit more aggressive. And I thought that was really the only thing I would question as far as Lincoln Riley's play calling uh, from the game yesterday. What do you think, Eric? Uh, the, the clock management stuff, right? Timeouts when maybe you don't need to use them. The urgency. I think that it's the sense of urgency at the end of the first half end of the second half too. It worked out, but that, that penalty helps in a big way. And maybe you're up against it. If, if you don't get that, uh, that being said, the confidence, I think, and kind of composure that you see in that situation is what we're talking about that helps them in that fourth quarter. I mean, for, for them to go to give up, you know, to, to not get the fourth down. And we talked about, how big that defensive stand was right on the the backside of that, but the offense to come back out and those last two drives that the gotta have them drives to struggle, you know, kind of in, in air quotes struggle the way they did in terms of a, a Lincoln Riley, Riley offense is not rolling to 40 points in that game again, to stick with it and have maybe your two best drives be your last two drives when it looked like the field had tilted a little bit toward LSU, that that's big. And again, it's the confidence that we talk about on defense being there on offense also to know, Hey, we're going to score a touchdown on every drive. We know we are, it didn't happen last drive. Didn't happen the drive before that means nothing for this next drive. And to have Miller Moss, do that that kind of drive again we're talking that's a second start i know he he feels like he's 29 years old right the way he carries himself <laughs> how much we've talked about him that's his second start and really i mean garrett nussmeyer when you look at kind of this being their second starts together he had so many more opportunities to play in other games passes a throw like miller did not have a ton come going into the holiday bowl going into this game here and so the composure for him to get hit all game, I mean, some of his best throws are with defenders just absolutely lighting him up. Uh, the ability to kind of come through when it matters, that's huge. That's huge for setting the table offensively down the road. That It's not a game at LSU. That was not when, when USC had the ball and the LSU fans were going, that was noisy. So to, to find success at that point in the game, in that kind of circumstance, now when you talk about going to Ann Arbor, going to some of these stadiums, maybe a, a championship game if, if you can get there in the Big Ten, you're comfortable, I think, in that because you have stuff to go back to and say, we've done this before. It, we know what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, look, Miller Moss was fantastic. And you guys pointed out some of the things that, that I was seeing. Um, his willingness to stand in there, take a hit, deliver a ball, sometimes to trust his guys to come down with uh, with a play. And um, he's good. He's good. And, and he's not going to he's not going to run around and make plays the way Caleb Williams did. But Lincoln Riley's offense doesn't always have to have that kind of quarterback. And um, he he certainly has skill position guys around him. Woody Marks can play. 
those receivers can play. And we spent we spent all offseason talking about the four uh the four right. softs, all of whom, all of whom made nice plays, right? They were as advertised, good players. Um, but it's Kyron Hudson, the guy that kind of the forgotten older guy, right? Who comes out and looks like Odell Beckham Jr. making, you know, making circus one-handed catches. I mean, where did this guy come from? Um just a just an incredible performance from him. I mean, really, uh, and and both of those one handed grabs were were such key plays in the game. And um, so that he was second great one. Him. You know that, that, that that second one especially was to get cracked like that in your ear hole and still maintain possession is just yeah. No, he was incredible. And 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 Kyle Ford has a big play, and you know. Uh, Obviously, the the tight end becoming an important part of the offense, especially in the second half, where uh, where they start they start throwing those 10, 12, 13 yard passes to the tight end and moving the ball downfield. That's that's important to be able to do that. And so, uh, Miller Moss and the passing game were great. I think we expected that LSU would try to dial up pressure. Um, their, their new defensive coordinator is known for that. And he did it, right? He did it. I mean, that, that is an aggressive defense and, uh, that has some pretty good players on it and, and, and USC's offensive line handled that. Okay. Not amazing, but okay. But Miller Moss handled it incredibly. He really did. Um, so that was all great. Um, the run game needs to be better. Sure. I, I was, you know, I thought coming into this that USC was going to have to be able to run the ball. I, I, I had said that in our show uh, Saturday, that they're going to have to be able to run the ball because if they if they can't run the ball, I don't know that we can protect Moss. Um, they didn't run it particularly well. They had some plays, but um, they ran it about as well as LSU did, a little over three yards a carry if you take away the, the you know, the 17-yarder to end the game. Um, they're going to have to get better there. And we'll talk about the the schedule coming up. Um, but the schedule coming up, that's not the last defense USC is going to face. It's going to be able to to bring pressure, and and so they're going to have to get better at that. Uh, you know, I suspect they will. You have you have a lot of you have some new guys playing. You have some old guys playing at new spots. That offensive line will probably improve as the year goes on, uh, but you only have a couple weeks now to do that. <laughs> So they better get better in the next couple of weeks. Um, but still, um, it was not a it was not what we've seen typically from Lincoln Riley's offenses over the last two years. They didn't put up 40 something points. They didn't come out and every time they came on the field, it's they just march right down and punch it in. The USC's offense, even last year when the offensive line didn't play as well, they still had a ton of games like that, right? Where just about every time they walk on the field, it's just Boom, 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 touchdown. It wasn't that kind of game. They had to fight and they had to scrap for this one. Um, and they did. Uh, okay, let's turn over the other side of the ball. The good and the bad on defense. Uh, a lot more good than bad, I suspect, but uh, we'll talk about both. Eric, what do you think? The good is that it it the blown plays, right? The the missed coverage, I think the the one where it looked like right. So it's always hard to say exactly what happened. Looked like Achille Arnold and Jalen Smith kind of wound up on the same guy. A receiver coming across the field ends up behind them, and that's a big explosive play for LSU. There was one run up the middle. It looked again looked like Easton Masquerade and Arnold maybe maybe gets a gap over blocked really well. Which again LSU was going to hit some running plays <laughs> that got blocked really well. To have a game where you can single out just a couple that look different than the than the rest of them that's different i mean we used to lose track of how many sort of missed assignments and, and just kind of blown coverages and tackles or, or run plays where six guys are in the same spot and nobody's over here uh so the rest of those plays where everybody is in their spot looks good solid facing the ball and and making sure tackles again i there was one I think one early where Easton is is trying to chase down a tight end yeah. up towards the the sideline and and missed a tackle again would have been tough to go chase that guy down but when you're talking about like single instances of missed tackles for this USC defense 
that's outstanding. The number of solo tackles in this one, the number of solo tackles that brought players down just short of first downs that ended up in punts and, and changes in possession. Outstanding, especially the corners, the safeties got in the linebacker. I mean, there, there were some missed tackles or you're never going to pitch a shutout there. It is hard to bring guys down in space now, but the ability to be in the right spot and to make the play when you were there, there was a lot of frustration. I know early on they're throwing the ball all over the place They're throwing the ball all over the place. They still had to sort of slowly march down the field and the USC defense always had an opportunity to stop them in this one. And I think that's what stands out. Just the structure, the soundness, and it goes back to, I had to write a story going into that game and, and all the quotes we had for it were about how confident the USC defense was in this scheme and how they were going to play. And I'm writing this story thinking, I I got to say it because that's how they feel. And that's what they're saying. I don't know how many USC fans are fully going to be on board and, and truly believe this. And now that you've got 60 minutes of it, you, you have to. And that's, I think what sort of shined the brightest for me on defense was just, they, they knew they were going to be fine. They knew they were going to make a play. They knew that they were going to be able to get off the field at some point. And, and that was big. I think that if you're looking for an issue, it's hard to, it's hard to fully judge it. We talked about the offensive tackles and LSU is not going to give up a lot of sight, right? We USC has played Oregon's offensive line was really good last year. Washington's offensive line was really good last year. Like USC has gone against some offensive lines that have given up three sacks in a season, four sacks in a season. So this LSU offensive line like they're gonna have to play some some very good defensive lines but they may put up great numbers in terms of quarterback pressures and sacks usc should have defensive ends that are being talked about like lsu's offensive tackles right they should have defensive ends where you're saying hey that's a that's a first round pick what are we going to do about that guy i think there were signs of life from that group but not enough in terms of getting home and, and having the stats to look at and say, hey, that's a bunch of quarterback pressures, a couple sacks in there, a bunch of tackles for loss. It it rose up occasionally. Again, it wasn't it wasn't a complete failure across the board at all. You can't find anything that fits in that category for USC's defense in right. this one. Uh, it's going to have to be better in terms of really affecting the quarterback and helping out your secondary when it comes to pass pass rush going forward. And, and I do think some of these offensive line matchups they're going to get now the rest of the way, maybe shift things back towards USC. What do you think, Mark? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I got a little emotional at the end of the game. Um, I saw that USC had a run defense again, and it felt really good to watch that happen. Especially, like I said, I go back, we talked about this on the show Saturday. I said, this was going to be a red zone game, whichever team, was stronger in the red zone defensively, was going to end up on the winning side of the ledger. And look, not only does the USC have a run defense, but they were the more, I think they were the more physical team in this contest as well. And when you look at them, you know, we were talking about in the press box, when you look at you know the team side by side, USC actually looked bigger too. So you combine the physicality, you combine their effort, which was significant, you, you combine that with the confidence that they're playing with. Um, that's a that's a good thing for this USC defense, especially where they were last year. And I'm not going to repeat everything that Eric said. They were in the right position. They tackled. Um, you, you, you saw the team running to the ball. It, there was, what, this many missed assignments, if you want to say that many? But they were talking with each other. If there's one thing, I, you know, Eric alluded to it, you need to get more pressure on the uh, the opposition's quarterback. While the edge guys, the defensive ends, didn't get there, I can say that they were disruptive. You know, they were they were doing a little bit, and it was getting better as the game went on. So now it's, let's go from disruptive to productive, because that's the next step. So you you've got the next game against Utah State. They're going to be playing Michigan in a few weeks. What? USC's defense did in this game, and I technically it wasn't a you know on the it wasn't a row game, it was a neutral site game, but they're going to be able to take that into Ann Arbor and say, you know what, we can draw on that. We played against the SEC. 
And Lincoln Riley said, that's what Big Ten football looks like. Yeah. There, there wasn't a lot to take away, not a lot of bad things. I think one positive, Chris, that you might need to fess up to now, moving Jalen Smith to cornerback. He's, he's found a home. I, I, he I, was physical. I, I'm look, look, I it's it's now two games in a row that Jalen Smith has played very well. And I was a doubter. I've been critical of Jalen. I thought for large portions of last year, he was awful. He, That's what I thought. Out of position. He really well. And he made a fantastic play on that running play around the left end that it looked yeah. like it was going to be a big yardage. And instead of big yards, it's now it's now second eight. I mean, that was a right. that was a gigantic play. No, look, he's he he has played very very <laughs> well, and and I'm thrilled to death for it. Um, look, this was a fundamentally sound defense of the type that we haven't seen in a long time. They tackled very well. Part of the reason they tackled very well is because they had less. There were less times when there were offensive players in space. The, the thing, it's hard to tackle people in space. Last year, you would have all kinds of missed tackles by linebackers, but what you'd see is there was a giant hole and the linebackers about four yards four yards off the line of scrimmage, and that's a recipe for, for missed tackles and disasters. The defensive line did a really nice job of shrinking down the holes. You'd see, uh, LSU likes to run a lot of the power game where they're, where they're pulling guards, the, the edge guys were consistently meeting those guys and, and, and smashing and smashing them inside such that there was no way to run outside and no, and not much room inside. That was actually the key to the game in many respects, because even the one big LSU run was a run where it wasn't a huge crease. Uh, he wiggled through a relatively small hole. There was nobody there and, and, and he had a big run, but you can't be a good defense if you can't stop the run. You can't. It's impossible. If teams can, if teams can just hand the ball off to the running back and move down the field consistently, you can't possibly be a good defense. That's the problem USC has had for a few years now. I don't think it's going to be a problem this year. And and I understand that LSU doesn't have uh, big time running backs, but what they have is a big time offensive line, which is far more important. And those guys were not pushing them around. USC but can play run defense. If you play run defense, you can you can hold people to reasonable numbers. They did, and Danton Lynn must have made some sort of second half adjustment because the other Kyron wide receiver in the game, who had nine catches for what ninety something yards in the first half, bagel in the second half. Yeah, well, and and look, here's the thing: uh, USC allowed a lot of underneath throws, uh, especially yeah. in the first half, but throughout the whole game. And I know that's frustrating, but when you think about what what Lynn is trying to do. One, he's trying to make sure you don't have big plays in the running game. You can't give those up. If you're in man coverage, your secondary and sometimes your linebackers are not in a position to actually see what's going on in the run game. They have their backs turned. So it so it it makes it makes your your run defense a lot more complicated if if you have to play man, and uh, and you can blitz without playing man if you want to run a a a um, you know a zone blitzing scheme where we're dropping defensive linemen back in coverage. And I know all you guys love that because we've been talking about that for years. Lynn decided we're going to play good run defense. We're going to keep everybody in front of us. We're going to force these guys to move down the field. Even when you get in the red zone and the field shrinks, we're going to see if they make mistakes and we're going to see if we can hold them down to a reasonable number of points. And it worked. It was the right strategy. So, you know, I don't like it any more than you guys do when, when we're allowing 10 yard passes between the twenties. But 10 yard passes between the 20s when you give up 20 points is okay with me. And, and that's essentially what they did. The downside is USC wasn't getting much pressure with four. And, and so they didn't blitz a lot. They did occasionally, sometimes to effect. But um, I don't know what to make of that. I, I will say that we know this LSU offensive line is good. USC will probably have more success rushing four against a lot of the other teams on the schedule. Um, but USC didn't have a great pass rush in the spring game either. And so I don't know if there's a problem there, but there might be. And, and so we're going to see in the coming weeks. I don't think it'll be a problem against Utah State, but it may be a problem against some of the other teams that uh, where, where you really need pressure on the quarterback. That That's the one downside. But 
it's hard to be too down on the defense when you go from three consistent years of horrific play with probably one good defensive performance the entire three years uh, to, to taking on what's supposed to be the best offensive line in the country for a program that always recruits athletes and not letting them run the ball, playing great red zone defense, holding them to 20 points. It's hard to complain too much about that. Right. I mean, if you're complaining about that, there's something wrong with you. So I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to complain about it. All right. Good and bad on special teams, guys. One of them, one of them seems pretty obvious to me. But uh, what, what, what did we, what did we like about the special teams? What were we concerned about? I want to be in the room when they show Zachariah Branch the film of his kickoff return and he's getting tackled by the kicker. Uh, we yeah, watched. I'm, not sure I've watched that. I'm actually not I've sure why he got back. I thought he had a chance. There were a cut. Co- there were a couple times he had the ball where he looked to be making like too much wiggling, trying to do multiple cutbacks instead of just hit the sideline. Hit the sideline and go, and I, I, I trust it. I, I trust he's going to yeah. get there. Yeah. I mean, Eddie Kuklisky was outstanding with the punting yesterday. That was I mean, he flipped the field a couple of times. He literally flipped the field a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, you know, back to Zachariah Branch. I, I'm assuming. I think he was having trouble locating the ball in Allegiant Stadium's cacophony of, you know, whatever was hanging from their ceiling. It was vertical. Um, they weren't. I think it was acrobats. Whatever it was, acrobats at that stadium. I, it, it just seemed like he wasn't judging the ball correctly. The, it's like, I, I know when they're doing warmups during practice, they're taught to you know, give yourself a chance to run into the catch so you've got momentum to take off. He was still catching the ball way too many times, and especially that first one when it seemed like, yo, you got 15 yards of grass and not a defender coming in close to you, but he fair caught the ball. Yeah. So I guess. If you want to, where they can improve, it would be that area. I thought their coverage was pretty darn good. So, Eddie Chaplisky flipping the field. Obviously, you don't want to miss that chippy field goal at the end of the first half. But, again, we're, I'm looking for stuff to complain about. It's hard. Well, that's a good start, the chip shot field goal. I mean, guys, in a game like that, you're playing against a really good opponent. It is a tight game. Both yeah. offenses are moving the ball a little bit, but having trouble putting points on the board. You have a chance to go up at the half. You can't miss that kick. You cannot miss that kick. That's a kick that most high school kickers make. I understand there was a lot of pressure. I get all that. You have to make that kick. Was it 29 yards? You have to make that kick. And 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 I know, look, I, I know the kicker knows that. And, and, um, and I want him to, you know, obviously we all want him to, to bounce back. And he did, he made some good kicks after that, but USC has had over the last couple of years, they've had way too many situations where they are missing very makeable kicks. And when you have Michigan and Penn state and Notre Dame and other teams on the schedule, you cannot give up cheap three points like that. It's going to cost you a game could have cost them the game last night. So I mean that's that's the only bad thing I saw, but it was bad. I mean it was bad. Um, yeah, look, the punting was fantastic, and look when you know Kelly goes for it down at the three yard line, figures USC still stuck deep in their own end. They move the ball about twenty yards. You're kicking from your own twenty three. Brian Kelly looks at that and says, "Okay." I'm okay with this. Probably getting the ball somewhere around midfield. I took my shot, didn't get it. Instead, they end up getting it back like inside the 15, I think. That Great is balance. that is enormous. And his ability, his ability to change the field and USC's coverage on those kicks is, I mean, that's that's a defense's be, uh, best friend. Um, starting, you know, having a team start at the 46. Or the seventeen is a big difference. That makes a you, that happened a few times. If that happens a few times during the game, that's going to add up most games to three, four, five points on the scoreboard. That's huge, and he was fantastic. And and that if you watch closely, that was a, the kick was actually intended to bounce to get you those extra yards. The way he held the ball, the way he tilted it on his approach to kick it, it was it, it was set up to do that. So again. We talk about, you know, USC needs a full-time special teams consultant. They're, they're doing the right things. 
They're doing the right things. Well, they've got one now. So let's just. Well, yeah, now they do. <laughs> let's just claim victory. Everybody's been asking for a special teams coach. We got a special teams coach. And look, look what happened. Coach Doherty did a great job. Yeah. Uh, anything to add to that, Eric, before we move on from special teams? I know you don't care about special teams. That's not your thing. No, I so so the one thing that will get brought up is kickoffs, right? So so the one that you had to have at the end bounces what two yards out of the back of the end zone? I mean, annihilated out almost hit the club seats uh out there in the back of the end zone. He had a few other kicks. I think one like landed at like the six, the seven, the twelve, I think at, at one point. It's tough to know. Sometimes I mean, sometimes that's the call. Sometimes that's the call. Hit it high. Hit it a little short. We want him to return it. I think, I think SC certainly on on the shortest one held them to before the twenty five yard line. So th there's definitely, it, it's not always easy. Hey, just kick it out of the back of the end zone every time. Now I, I would, I I wouldn't let anybody <laughs> touch the ball as a returner because everyone's got maybe maybe not everyone has Zachariah Branch, but everyone's got their version of him. So but I don't think it's always quite as easy as what's he doing? Why can't he just hit, right? Like there, there's different calls for different things. And if you can go cover it, keep him at the 22, keep him at the 19, you know, whatever that is, you want to mix that up. I, I think every once in a while. Yeah. At least one of those short kicks uh, was almost certainly planned because you could see by his approach, he changed his, yeah. he changed his angle to kick it to the, to the corner. Uh, and it worked out. I, I'm with you. I, I, I don't want to get cute about that sort of thing. Please just put it in the end zone and uh, and let's not mess around with it. Um, and look, USC USC had one big kick return, could have gone for a touchdown, probably should have gone for a touchdown. Um, but that was that was a very well blocked return, and it was a time when USC really needed right. LSU made that big mistake; they get the fifteen yard penalty on the touchdown. So you look at it and say, okay. I know he's going to get a chance to return this, and it was blocked perfectly. And that Brian Jackson, true freshman running back in on special teams, one of the one of the key blocks there. And they, you know, that forty-four yard return was a huge momentum swing after LSU had scored a touchdown. So that was that was big. And we've been calling for USC to find a way to to block on kick returns. If you have a guy that can run like Branch, you kind of want to block for him. They did on that one. Um, okay, so. We had the nice win. We're all happy about it. USC is feeling good about themselves, feeling confident. After what you saw in week one, both USC's performance against LSU and some of the other games that we witnessed, does it change your view of the season trajectory? We all made predictions Saturday, talked about, you know, what would be a good season from our perspective. Um, so we had our, you know, we had our, we had our good case and our bad case scenarios in our head coming into the first week of the season. Seeing what you've seen, do you see it differently now? Mark, do you? No, I'm still, I, maybe I'll use the Chris Arledge caveat. If USC gets by Michigan, I'm going to go from 10 and two, they'll go 11 and one. This team, look, we, we all watch the same thing. This team is different than last year yep. from everything. Their competence, the way they play, the way they look. Um, we're gonna if USC can get by the pig farmer next week, this is gonna be their first test against a quarterback that's mobile think, and can move around. I think they will, by the way, Mark. I don't want to I don't want to make my prediction too early, but I think they'll beat him this year. You're saying Utah State isn't quite Utah with a pig Undefeated farmer. Undefeated Utah State. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, you know, just like Let's clean up. It's it's the team can clean up a little bit what they needed to prove on from week one against LSU. Get by Utah State. Now you get the bye week. Um, and come in prepared to play Michigan. We know that when Lincoln Riley has time to get his team prepared, we saw it in the bowl game against Louisville. He now has a defensive coordinator that he can lean on. We know what Dan Lynn is capable of doing. We've seen the difference they've made already. I'm not ready to go from 10 and 2 to 12 and 0 yet, but give me one more win. Give me that win up in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Ask me this question again after that game, Chris. Okay, I will, Mark. I'll write that down. Uh okay. I mean, he's not ready to go 12 and 0 yet. Uh, I'm not either, by the way. That 12 and 0. I'm still 10 and 2 plus. That's though. a tough that's number, man. That's 12. 12 is a tough number. I mean, uh, you know, 
Nick Saban, Pete Carroll, Urban Meyer, none of those guys did 12 and 0 very often. Um, uh, what do you think, Eric? Your perspective changed? Yeah, I'll, I'll go, I'll go with Mark. If USC can get by its next 10 games, I'll go, I'll go 12 and 0. I think if you, if you yeah. give me the next 10 wins, I think they can <laughs> beat Notre Dame. Uh, so I said going into the year nine and three, I think with that, right, this one for me eliminates one of those losses. I think 10 and two, the, the health of the offensive, right. That, that depth is still so shaky, especially out at offensive yeah, tackle. It's very true. The idea of, of talking about wins and losses that just anticipates perfect health across the board offensive line and and a little bit defensive line we saw much more depth much more competent competitive depth on the defensive line in that game than we've seen in years past so i think you're more okay on that on that defensive line if a guy misses a game here or there the offensive line was not phenomenal against lsu and still if any of those guys came out you'd hold your breath on what, what, whatever play, whatever game, whatever drive that might be. So that's still kind of walking on that, that tightrope there uh, in terms of talking about, you know, no losses or, or even one loss. But with that, I, I think 10 and two at this point looks entirely doable. And, and maybe you just have to, you don't have to be great to do that. You just have to be who you are. If you're USC, you don't need a ton of bounces. You don't need luck here and there. I think that that uh, is is not not nuts to talk about. And again, you know, again, if if we get Mark's win at, at Michigan, uh, I think ten and two is kind of coasting. But that that's the one thing: the health and the yeah. depth on the offensive line is what still has to kind of hang in there in, in terms of that conversation when you're looking seven weeks, eight weeks, you know, eleven weeks down the road. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, USC could afford to lose. I mean, they, you, you don't want to lose somebody in that secondary, but you could and you could survive it. Even Kamari Ramsey, who I think has made a huge difference. Um, you can lose the defensive line. I looked, the guy that we thought was going to be the key to everything defensively up front didn't even play a ton. I mean, he had, by the end, 28 snaps or something. But Bear Alexander uh, didn't even play as many as, as, as much as uh, some of those other uh, inside guys. I don't think there's anybody up front that if you lose them, you can't bounce back. Um, you lose, you can lose any of the wideouts, right? You can lose a running back. I really like Woody Marks, but uh, we saw just a little bit uh, from Quentin Joyner, but a little bit I saw I liked. I mean, uh, even Miller Moss, who you never want to lose a quarterback, the leader of your team, and a guy who's that good. I'm willing to bet if Jaden Maiava stepped in and played at USC, he'd play well. Right. I'm willing to bet that but you can't have you can't have injuries up front, especially at offensive tackle. You just can't. And if, if you do, that changes everything for USC. That was remember that game up at Stanford where USC was ranked number one preseason and and they ended up playing a, a very young center and like the whole thing just fell apart. Like everything. A legend apart. of Cyrus Hobby. Yeah, I mean, the, these things can happen. So, um, but if they can avoid that, you know, you look at it, you look at the you look at the Michigan game. You knew coming in that Michigan was going to be really good defensively. They are. And that defensive front is going to be a huge challenge for USC's offensive line. But you know what? USC's defense is going to be a major challenge for Michigan's offense. Michigan's offense was absolute garbage in that over. Absolute garbage. And, you know, you, you saw the, well, they scored 30 points. No, they didn't. The defense had a pick six. They also had a short field of, you know, I think the first touchdown was like a 23-yard drive because they got a turnover early. Michigan, Michigan, uh, I think, was under five yards per play on the day against Fresno State. That's horrific. Michigan has an awful offense. And Michigan's about to get their head caved in this week by Texas. Because Here, while I'm not... Keep uh, going on this, but but Texas playing Michigan, I think, is the best thing for USC. That tech, what Lincoln Riley is going to be able to learn from that Texas offense working against that Michigan defense, I think that's I think that's huge for I game planning you. and for yeah. Lincoln Riley. 
I agree. You're going to, you're going to see Mi- Michigan have to line up against a team that has athletes like the athletes you have, and you're going to see what they have, right? You're going to be able to find weaknesses that you pro- that probably don't get exposed by Fresno State. But Michigan's entire offense got exposed by Fresno State. They were terrible. They were terrible running the ball. They were worse passing the ball. Their offensive line is awful. I mean, it's – I'm not saying they won't get better. It's an opening game. you got a whole new offensive line. I suspect they'll get better. But when are they going to get better? Before the Texas game? No. So is it going to be between that and the USC? I mean, Michigan's, Michigan's offense right now is a gigantic question mark. And that's being generous because I, I don't even see it as a question mark. I see it as an awful unit. And everybody who was talking about, well, Michigan defending national champion, all that stuff, I get that. But all those guys are gone. 17 senior starters gone, including the quarterback, including the entire offensive line, including the head coach, gone. That is not the same football team. Defensively, they're going to be very good, and they're going to give USC's offense all it can handle. I get that. But if that Michigan team's if that Michigan team scores more than 20 points on USC's defense, I'll be stunned. They're awful. So you look at that and you say, okay, that's a pretty winnable game. I mean, you know, playing the national, the defending national champion at their place is never a cakewalk, and it's not going to be a cakewalk. But USC can win that game. And if USC beats Michigan, you look at the schedule and you say, okay, you avoid losing to a team you shouldn't lose to. You've got two home games, Penn State and Notre Dame. You lose them both, you're 10 and 2. You split and you are in a prime, you know, a prime position for for the uh, postseason. So, and by the way, Notre Dame didn't look great. Again, Notre Dame defensively is going to cause problems for USC's offensive line unless USC's offensive line really improves. I think we all know that. But that offense didn't look like much. I like the running backs. I know the quarterback has had some success in the past, but Notre Dame's Notre Dame's protection for uh, uh, for Riley Leonard wasn't great, and Riley Leonard wasn't great, and the receivers just look like a bunch of guys, just a bunch of guys. They don't have LSU athletes on the outside. They do not have USC athletes on the outside. They just got a bunch of dudes. I think I, you know, I mean, look, it's crazy because USC is coming off a five loss season. And they've only played one game. But I look at the schedule and I say, I think they beat Michigan. I think they beat Notre Dame. I don't know about Penn State yet. Penn State had a nice win on the road. Uh, Penn State's going to play really good defense. That's going to be another huge challenge for the USC line. But if you're just talking about whether this team can get to 10-2, and two, I think they can. This is a legitimate playoff contender right now. And I said before the game, as, as Mark pointed out, he's needling me because I didn't want to make a call. I said, if you can beat LSU, and I think you can, 10 and 2 looks very doable. 10 and 2 looks very doable, especially after seeing what Michigan and Notre Dame put on the field. It does. Uh, by the way, guys, where do you rank this game in recent USC history? What does it what does it what does it compare favorably? How far back do we have to go? to find a game that we look at and say, okay, that's at the same level as this win over uh, LSU uh, on opening day before a national television audience. What do you think? You got to go back a ways. I'll just talk about the vibe, the, the, the atmosphere of that game. It it felt big time. It felt like a playoff game. It felt like these teams were trying to settle the 2003-2004 national championship. They did. It's ours now. It's, un, it's, yeah. it's undisputed at this point. Um. And it was the atmosphere. USC finally went back to that type of environment and they came out. You know what? I'll take it back. We It was USC's win at Ohio State. You probably have to go there. What was that? 2009? 2009? 15 years ago. Yeah, that may be right. That, and look, that, that was not a surprise because at that point, USC was you know, in the top four every year. And you knew it would be a tough game, but winning at Ohio State wasn't a surprise. Um, but that may be. What, what do you have, Eric? I, I, think I, have, I think I have a game or two in mind, but I'm, I, but I'm not sure I can beat what Mark just gave us. The, that, one, that one's good because I, I have to skip over a few. I mean, the, the Rose Bowl against Penn State, just in terms of like 
what a what a great game it was to watch and entertaining and coming down to the end and having to make plays at the end of the game. The similarities between this one and the game at Auburn, uh, there, there's there's too many, right? That that's the one for me. It's the first game of the year. It's how are we going to look after last year? It's an SEC team. I know it's not playing down there, uh, but that's the that's the feel. Everyone kind of writing USC off as you know, yeah, they're okay, but they're not going to be able to compete with an SEC team. Like the 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 storylines on those two, and then for what it could project forward for that team and and for this team, uh, I think I think that's it for me. Yeah, I think that's right. There are, there are a few that I considered. I I considered the Kiffin uh the Kiffin win against Oregon at their place. Okay. That was a fantastic win against a team that had really given us problems and we're playing with, you know, a depleted roster. That was a huge game. Um Coach O against Stanford. Different type of game, but just uh in terms of um, you know, cuz we we'd already we'd already <laughs> We already had an interim coach. The season was already in trouble. Um, but to come out and play defense the way they played it against a really good Stanford team and win that game, that that was that was also one I considered. But but I think I think Auburn is right. But Auburn is right only if USC goes on a trajectory from here that's that's upward, right? I mean, if if USC had beaten Auburn and then and then finished nine and three that year it would be a different, a different deal. But there were all the question marks. Can USC do it without Carson Palmer? Was this just a one-time thing? Can they match up with these big bad dudes in the SEC? Uh, and, and to really hand it to Auburn and then, and then go on to win a national title that year uh, was incredible. But the reason Auburn was incredible is because USC went on to win a national title. I don't know that USC has to win the national title this year. I don't think they're going to. I, you know, I saw what George was putting on the field. Um, but that being said, USC had enormous question marks, probably more than that than that 2002 Auburn or 2003 Auburn game, right? Because people are talking about how Lincoln Riley has never put a defense on the field, never done it. And everybody said, if he could ever find a way to put a real defense on the field to match with those offenses, USC is going to be a problem for everybody. Yeah. I think he has. I think he has. And if he's if 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 USC is now going to be not just okay defensively, but good defensively, and Saturday they were good defensively. If they're going to do that, USC's a problem for everybody. Probably can't beat Georgia this year. But I'm looking at the rest, and maybe not Ohio State. We'll see what Ohio State does against a good team. But I'm looking at the rest of the top ten, and I'm saying Michigan. Yep, that's a that's a winnable game. Oregon? You kidding me? Oregon? Oregon barely escaped with their lives against an F- FCS opponent, and 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 Oregon and Oregon averaged I think five and a half yards of play against that against that lower level team. Oregon should be embarrassed. Dan Lanning should resign today because he has he has Uncle Phil backing up Brings trucks every single day to the complex so he can pass out large bags of cash and out recruit everybody in the country. He puts together this roster. Everybody looks at the roster and says, geez, they're good everywhere, right? That's what they say. And then they go out and play like that. That's embarrassing. The question I had asked when Landing got hired and put his staff together is, I know these guys can recruit. I know they can. Can they coach? I still don't think we know the answer to that. They dropped both of the games to Washington last year. They probably should have won both of them. And then they go out and play like that in their opener when they're number three in the country. I don't know. All I'm saying, guys, is I'm looking at most of the teams in the top ten, and I'm saying – I think USC has a chance on a neutral side against those guys. I'm not saying they beat them, but Notre Dame is a top 10 team. Can they beat Notre Dame? You bet. They can beat that Notre Dame team. They can. So I don't know. I mean, if, if they go on a trajectory where they win 10 games and they get in the playoff, then this game where they show the country that this is a different program than you've yep. been accustomed to seeing the last few years – may stand up uh, like that Auburn game in terms of uh, of where it ranks in history. We'll see. Yeah. 
you know, Oregon fans, they're shook right now. You brought them up. Um, you, you go, if you want some fun reading, go to their message board. And you're, the, the common theme is this. I did. Wow, that USC team looks different. And uh-oh, Lincoln Riley has a defense, Sigh. I mean, Lincoln Riley with a defense? We know what Pete Carroll did with his team when they were a good, complete team. Lincoln and Riley might now understand what it means to have a complete team. And that's bad news for the rest of college football. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I, I thought I had it here. Uh, I think, I mean, I think Oregon ran for like three yards of carry in that game. Really? With all those offensive linemen they've recruited? Oh, the coping mechanisms they're working with right now are hysterical. Well, it's easy to get up when you're playing against the LSU. You know, Oregon was playing lowly Idaho. They just didn't weren't up for the game. Well, well, talk to your coach. I, I mean, I, I hope they start getting up for games then because there aren't many teams on their schedule that are less talented. I know Idaho's a pretty good FCS team. I get that. But there aren't a lot of teams on their schedule once they get into the con into conference play that don't have better talent than those guys. So I, this isn't an Oregon show, but I'm not going to pass up an opportunity to bash Oregon. They embarrass themselves Saturday. They were in a 17-14 dogfight late in the game against an FCS team when they come in ranked number third and, by the way, had been chirping all offseason about how good they are. Because they're, all, they're constantly talking about how good they are. Dan Lanning is not afraid. He, he does not buy into the Lou Holtz philosophy where you talk about how the other team is so intimidating, you don't know if you can play with them. Lanning goes and talks and talks and talks and talks, and then they play like that. That's a joke. Hey, Oregon fans, if you're watching this, your team looked like garbage. I'd be scared to death if I were you. You think that team's going to beat Ohio State? You guys are going to roll by 40 unless you get your act together. So after week one, how would you rank the top five schools in the Big Ten Conference right now, Chris? Well, you only had, you only had two that had good wins. That doesn't mean that some of the others won, right? I mean, I know Ohio State's going to be a good football team. I actually know that Oregon's going to be a good football team. Not as good as they think they're going to be. Uh, or thought they were going to be before the game Saturday, but they're going to be a good football team. Um, but look, Penn State and USC are the only teams that uh, that actually show that they can take on at least a halfway decent opponent and play well on both sides of the ball. Northwestern only gave up 40 rushing yards to Miami of Ohio. <laughs> I, I mean, we're throwing we're throwing stuff in there. I, I have them number three in the conference. Eric. I think I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I, think, I wasn't pushing for them above that. Look, everybody. Everybody has their opinions formed about these teams based on what they did last year. And, you know, Mizzou is number 11 because last year they had a really good defense and that guy's gone, but somehow Mizzou's still great. So I don't know what the rankings are going to look like tomorrow when they come out, but should USC be ranked in the top 10 and in the top three or four teams of the big 10 after that performance? Of course they should, because who else did that? Miami had a Miami had an impressive performance against, a garbage Florida team, but a Florida team that has some talent because Florida always has players, right? Um, I thought that, you know, my, Notre Dame wanted a place that is a tough place to play. That is. It's A&M, and A&M usually falls all over themselves anytime, anytime there's any uh, – uh, anytime the other team has a pulse. So uh, I downgraded a little bit. But still, winning at Kyle Field is tough. They did that. I liked Penn State's win at Morgantown. I don't know that West Virginia is a great team, but you go on the road and you smash somebody at a tough place to play, that counts. But, I mean, how many teams actually actually did that? Other than, I mean, USC did. These other teams should have to show something. USC should be ranked in the top 10. Oregon should be ranked. Uh, I think Idaho was seventh in the, S at the FCS. Oregon should be ranked about fourth or fifth in the FCS this week. Then we'll see if they can do anything against somebody else. I don't know. Okay, guys, uh, that's enough Oregon talk. Or maybe it's not. I'll probably catch myself uh, trashing them again before this is all over. A uh, couple, uh, couple other things we need to hit. Um, we've been talking about how Riley needs a proof of concept for these defensive recruits, right? They, they like the staff. They, they enjoy. They, they, they're, you know, a lot of these guys are cautiously optimistic, but they sort of want to see it. Is this enough to change the momentum of USC's defensive recruiting? We got to find out if Lincoln Riley's phone stopped buzzing yet. He hadn't he hadn't heard from the he hadn't turned his phone on yet after the game. Uh, Scott asked him that question: Will this type of result impact recruiting? You know, he got that Chestershire smile on his face before he answered the question. 
But the answer is in the affirmative, absolutely. I mean, this type of win doesn't hurt the program, right? You've I mean, got defensive players all up. over the country. You've got defensive players all over the country saying, okay, okay, I've seen it. I can do that. I can play with that. I can work in that system. And look, what they get to tell people is, this is what we did in one off season. This isn't where we're going to be in a year or two or three right. years. This is one off season. And by the way, look at... Look at a lot of the guys we were using and compare compare their ranking to yours. You think you're a better athlete than those guys. But in one offseason, we took that group and took on the best offensive line in the country. That's a pretty good sales pitch. Now, it all falls apart if the defense falls apart. But that's a fundamentally sound defense that probably isn't going to fall apart. They may have some bad weeks, but it's not like they're going to. It's not like they're going to start going out and giving up forty-eight points a game like Alex Grinch's defense. As you can tell by looking at them, they know what they're doing and they and they play their assignments. So, what do you think, Eric? Yeah, I. I mean, I know you love moral victories. I talked I about that coming in. Look, USC could have sold a twenty to seventeen loss in that game yeah. to recruits. Right. We we have a defense. We held them to 20 points. We need you to help us get over like that would have been I think maybe you don't get everybody, but that would have started the conversation with a lot of guys of, hey, we're serious about that side. A win, a win and holding them to 20 points. Yes. Yes. You can get on the phone with any any defensive recruit now and they will listen because they saw that. And again, they know they know how USC was talked about last year. They know what they've heard from everybody all off season, whenever USC comes up and they say, you can't go over there. They don't play defense. That's one call to them now and say, Hey, did you see what happened? And they all saw it. Yep. You can't, you can't sign anybody. Now you can't get anybody on campus in uniform now. So it's going to matter what it still feels like in December when they actually have to make their decision. But this opened eyes of, big time guys where yeah they needed to see it and now they've seen it if usc can keep up i mean anything close to that like what you're saying the pitch of in one off season we did this when we start going more and more and more we're gonna be georgia's defense right we're, we're gonna be able to put that out there yeah yeah that's big that's big i think the biggest thing you'll usc will be up against when it comes to recruiting the defensive guys is the new narrative, the new negative recruiting. Well, Dan Lynn's going to be a head coach next year somewhere else. So he's not going to be your defensive coordinator. And you know what? I, I'm I mean, parsing maybe. it in sarcasm. Again, I'm parsing it in sarcasm, but there's a hell of a lot of truth behind that. I mean, look, that, that could very well happen. I, I suspect there are some athletic directors out there that are looking at, uh, at Lynn and saying, I think he could do something for us. And maybe he gets the job that he wants. Um he doesn't have to take the first head coaching job that comes no. along. And I suspect he knows that. Um, and if they lost him uh, and you bumped up Matt Ince to defensive coordinator, I, I suspect there's a chance he could still play defense, right? I mean, they have it's not it's not a one man band. You have you have a bunch of guys on that staff that that seem to really know what they're talking about. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, um, you know, they were they were teasing us with uh, with uh, Joachim Stewart. Um, um, news. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with that. Knowing recruits these days, it probably just means he bought his top 46 hats for, uh, for the table at his signing day ceremony. But, uh, but I think a kid like that, who, who's clearly impressed with USC's defensive staff and the university and, and seems to like LA, a kid like that needs to know that he's not going to have his career wasted. And you play for Alex Grinch, you're going to have your career wasted. But I think he watches that game and says, I think I can go there and they'll develop me and we'll win games and, and I can get the other stuff I want. I mean, it, it gives him, it gives a guy like that something to think about, uh, which is nice. All right, let's close it with this. This is going to be a very short segment because the next opponent is Utah State. And I'll be honest, guys, uh, while the team can't afford to overlook Utah State, I sure can. And, and I'm not sure that I want to spend a lot of time talking about them. Who wants to talk about Utah State? Either one of you have anything interesting to say about them? I know their quarterback from last year. That's it. That, that, big farmer. That's my, break, that's my breakdown of Utah State. It's Stop time the to pig get revenge farmer. on the pig farmer. Yeah. Stop the pig farmer. USC might have a chance to win this game. I, My thing has nothing to do with Utah State. I would love to see a sellout. 
in the Coliseum, right? The, the, that's yeah. kind of the talk. Is there uh it's, that's hard. I, I know a night game, but you get out of the heat. Yeah. So the conversation when you play this team in between LSU and Michigan is, do you, do you have a come down game from what you did against LSU and not in terms of, are you going to lose to Utah state? Although if you go full Oregon, there's a chance that that, that happens against a team like this. Uh, but it's ha- how do you play? Are you still sharp? Are you still fully into it? I don't have any doubts about this staff being able to get that team there. It would be something to have them show up in the Coliseum. Again, they, this group has done everything that that has been needed and more this offseason to get to this point. For them to come out of the tunnel and have that stadium just be absolutely lit up, fired up for the first home game. USC, we talked about this after the game, hasn't won at the Coliseum since early October Three game losing streak there. I, I, know, I know, Chris, you wanted to hear that, but again, it would it would be it would send a message to have that thing be absolutely fired up for the first home game of this year after they went and did that to LSU. So yeah, you want to see them sharp. You want to see that defensive line right pressure after pressure, six seven sacks, like proof of concept there that you can get that done before Michigan, but. In reality, the hope is you get up early, you get guys out, and you see all the depth. Because when you look down the line, and I know coaches, right, we're going to take this one at a time. We're not looking at anybody else. They know. They know what their schedule looks like. They know where they can find those four games where you can play some of the true freshmen. This is one. This is absolutely one of them. So seeing all that depth, some of those freshman corner defensive backs, coming in maybe some of the the younger defensive linemen get in there too that's it for for me can you come out strong on offense buttoned up on defense roll out to a, to a you know 32 point lead 35 point lead early first half and then see what everyone else has and and mix guys in and get some playing time for everybody yeah, that's this is a depth building game. This is an opportunity to get the young guys out there to get real action. You learn a ton when you're a young guy and you actually get in a real football game. And 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 so and and I think it's important for the offensive line too. We have some young guys. You have some guys who have moved around. Um, you have you have Utah State and you have a bye. You have a couple of weeks uh, to to iron out the things you need to iron out before you go to Ann Arbor. And uh, I don't think I don't think I, I, I'm not worried about USC coming out not ready to play, just because this is not the seventh year of Pete Carroll, right? Where guys assume that when they walk out on the field, they can just blow people out because that's what they always do. This is a USC program that has had people talking bad about it for a couple of years people doubting it all off season, including really well-known commentators talking about how your coach is going to get fired at the end of the year. And right. I mean, that's, this is not a USC team that's going to say, Oh, okay, whatever. I don't really know. These guys are, these guys are driven and they're excited. They're going to come out and they're going to beat the Tara guys. Right. I mean, they're going to, there's no, there's no question about that. Um, and what you hope you do is you you get some experience for guys who need it and you avoid injuries. That's it. If you do that, it's uh, it's a win. Um, that's all I have to say about Utah State. Utah State's not very exciting. And if you're a Utah State fan, I'm sorry that I feel that way. I would like to sit here and talk about you guys for an hour. I actually did read the preview. Sounds like you guys have. Um, uh, sounds like you guys uh, have have lost some on the, uh, on the offensive, uh, in the offensive backfield uh, to the portal and the like, but, um, but Look, the most, what you're excited about. the most interesting know. thing, the most interesting thing about Utah state is the Robert Morris cornerback. Like that, that's, that's the most interesting thing so far about a Utah state game. Okay. Well, that's not very exciting. So I think we just go ahead and close this down. Now, anything else we want to say before we sign off guys? That's it. Feels good to be one and oh. We you you talked about kind of Utah State and the bye. Gosh, the difference in feeling of this program. If that first game goes the other way, to have to sit on that for a while. This this is a high this program is riding right now into these next couple of weeks. You've got two weeks 
to get ready to go beat the defending national champ at their place, which will probably stick you somewhere around number six or number seven in the country with a very, very good shot of making the, uh, the first 12 team college football playoff. That's a lot on the line. You got two weeks to get ready for that. Call your shot now. Where is USC moving up in this week's poll from 23 to what? I think they should be in the top 10. I think they'll probably land around 12. Good 12, 12 is what I thought, but yeah, right. If, if you throw everything out and you start ranking from now, Georgia probably had the best win. Maybe Notre Dame's up there. USC has, has the third best win. I mean, I mean, if, unless you want to argue it's the second best win of the, of the first week, but yeah. that that's worthy a top eight, top nine, but they'll, they'll end up outside the top 10 because everyone just kind of moves up there. Yeah. I mean, they're going to jump in front of some of those teams that are in front of them. Like, you know, Kansas, what well, Kansas, that was stupid. Anyway, they're going to jump in front of guys like that. They should jump in front of Mizzou. They should jump in front of Utah. They should Utah, Utah will probably turn out to be a good team this year. I, I expect they will, but but those teams haven't done anything yet. And everybody's always said, well, if you if Lincoln Riley just had a defense, well, okay, he's got one. A Lincoln Riley football team that has a defense is going to beat Kansas and Mizzou and Utah and all those other teams that are sort of hanging about right there at the bottom half of the top 10 or, or just outside it. They're going to. They're going to. Because Lincoln, Lincoln Riley's teams will score points. And if USC could stop you, what are those teams going to do? It's stupid. They won't be in the top 10. They should. But uh, if they beat Michigan at their place, they're going to be deep inside the top 10 and, and on their way. So they got two weeks to get ready for it. So, okay, I guess we're done. Guys, it's nice of you to get together and do this in person. I appreciate that. <laughs> Not every week. This week was Not, good. Just, yeah, just this week. Don't ever do it again. Okay, that's it. We'll see you next week. Until then, fight on, everybody.